It is now my great pleasure to introduce my esteemed colleague, Professor Philip Pizzo, who will talk about the distinguished careers. Well, good afternoon, good morning. It's wonderful to be here with you today. Uh, I'd like to focus our attention on this evolving change that's taking place that we've been hearing about from the very visionary work that Laura Carstensen has done and the extraordinary contributions that Andrew Scott has just revealed to us. And I think the question that governs the conversation is not just about aging and longevity, but how do we think about, individually and collectively, aligning our health spans with our lifespans, regardless of how long we live, how do we make sure that we have the highest quality that we can accomplish during our lives? We can think about this from an individual perspective, we can think about it from an institutional perspective, and also from a societal perspective. For example, the Hartford Foundation has recently come up with the Societal Aging Index, and they've looked at a number of variables that contribute to how societies, including countries, will do. For example, well-being, measures of how disability-free aging will take place. Equity, what's the degree of poverty and educational attainment? Cohesion, what's the degree of intergenerational interactions that take place? Um, what, about, uh, what about our productivity? Um, how well are we doing as we take on new tasks um, during aging? And security, how safe do we feel? Um, what's the degree of protection you know, for us? So when we think about the societal changes, I'm going to come back to that a little bit later in the presentation, but I want to frame this in a broader question that relates to our life transitions. And specifically, it builds on this thesis. As we construct our lives, how do we continue to develop new skills as we move through them? Now, we all know that universities have been doing much the same thing since the 11th century. They've been educating young people at the beginning of their lives. The question that I'd like to pose for you today is what role do they play as we migrate through our lives? How could we, for example, learn all we need to know in our early 20s and even into our 30s? We heard extraordinary presentations this morning on changes in science and technology. We'll hear more about biology and oncology later today. And we need to think about how can we regain or accomplish some of these new skill sets later in our life? And by here, I mean during our midlife, generally in the period from our 40s to our 50s to our 60s and 70s and, and beyond. So an important thesis is can we use our universities to come back to and reacquaint ourselves with new skill sets that will enable us to lead our lives more successfully with wellness and lifespan being connected? We began an experiment about this at Stanford University in 2015 when we enrolled our first class into what we call the Stanford Distinguished Careers Institute. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that in a few moments, but I wanna frame the context for it first. I wanna begin by just thinking about some of the epidemiological data that helps to gird the principles that underlie what we're attempting to achieve. There's some really profound data that came out of from a, a study from uh, Anne Case and uh, Angus Deaton, who won the Nobel Prize in economics just a couple of years ago, that has looked at what's happening in the United States in terms of this longevity equation. And one of the things that was observed in that study, which went from 1999 to 2013, is that while it's true that many people are benefiting from longevity, there is one group that's not. And that is non-Hispanic, whites, men and women who've had a high school education or less, who are largely living in the Midwest or South, who are actually dying early. Why are they dying? They're dying because of opioids. They're dying because of suicide. They're dying because they have a sense of hopelessness around them. They've lost purpose, which is really an important um, point. Um, and I think when you couple that um, with additional data that comes from Andrew Septo that tells us that not only purpose but social engagement 
is really critically important, one begins to think about some of the contributing factors that may lead to a more successful lifespan. When you add to that further from the studies that Raj Chetty at Stanford has done that has looked at which parts of the United States map to having a more successful life journey, it turns out that those parts of the United States that do tend to be around um, the perimeters. Um, they tend to include not only socioeconomic status, but equally important lifestyle changes. So here we begin to think about some of the correlates that might be important for us to consider when we think about lifespan and health span. Purpose, community, social engagement, and wellness. Drilling down a little bit further into that, when you think about purpose, the work of Bill Damon is really pretty important. He's identified purpose in two ways, what we do for ourselves and how we do beyond ourselves. So he studied this in um, adolescents and youngsters from 12 to 24 years of age and determined that about 20% of individuals actually have a sense of purpose beyond themselves about um, almost 25% do not have a sense of purpose at all. Now I'm sure everyone in this room does have a sense of purpose. The rest are dabblers and dreamers. But he went back um, with Ann Colby and began to look at some of these same metrics as it relates to people in midlife. And here he studied another 1,200 individuals and it turns out that about a third actually have a sense of purpose that goes beyond the self. There is those who have a sense of purpose for themselves, financial security, the nature of their job, um, how they engage in their community. Um, but there are those who extend that um, beyond themselves to things that have a broader societal impact. Do they want to change the world? Do they want to do something uh, that extends what they know to others? They, they want to have an impact um, on other people in their community. So purpose is critically important and we know correlates with a highly successful outcome. In fact, all purpose, morbidity and mortality correlates with those who have a positive sense of purpose. And there is large bodies of data um, that increasingly support um, this particular contribution. So purpose, and we heard a great presentation this morning um, about the impact of purpose on our communities so that is so significant and inspirational. When we think about the second important factor of social engagement, I think about the Harvard study that followed now over 80 years, 268 individuals, men of course at the time, um, who began Harvard and who were followed during their lifetimes to see what correlated with a positive outcome. And what did correlate with a positive outcome were a variety of different factors that speak to happiness. Do you have a successful marriage as you move through your life? Um, do you have close connections with your children and your community and family? Is your life relatively stress-free and secure? These are the correlates that make a big difference in terms of social engagement. And that's coupled with some other very important data. A recent publication has demonstrated in over 400,000 cases based upon a series of meta-analyses that in that, the, that people who have social engagement have a 50% increase in uh, survival and those who lack it have about a 30% increase in their likelihood for developing cardiovascular or neurodegenerative disease. So purpose, community, really important in terms of social engagement. And then the third, of course, is wellness. When we think about wellness, of course, we tend to think about our activities in terms of our biology, but I would um, like to share with you that equally important and even perhaps more so are lifestyle changes and the environment that we're part of. And we know that when measures of purpose have been articulated, of, of um, wellness have been articulated, that it turns out that community is probably the single most important factor, followed by lifestyle, followed by a stress-free um, life, followed by purpose. These are the important metrics that one tends to look at uh, in this particular arena. So it's based upon these three factors, purpose, social engagement, and wellness, that we began configuring the pilot program that we started at Stanford that in 2015 that I'd now like to describe for you briefly. If I can have the uh, slide that shows the program. So this is called the Stanford Distinguished Careers Institute. And I want to share with you just a few parts about it and then 
take you um, beyond it to what I hope will become much more of a national and global effort. And it's asking the question, what's the role of the university in taking individuals like you in this room and bringing you back and allowing you to reignite your sense of purpose, to re-engage your social connectedness, and to recalibrate your sense of wellness. And if we can do that on an individual level, can we actually compress your morbidity? Can we shift to the right and reduce the time during which the normal consequences of aging might take place? That's the fundamental thesis behind this program. How do we do it? We're taking individuals in midlife and asking them if they're interested in applying to our program to tell us which of eight purpose pathways they'd be interested in pursuing. Things like arts and humanities, business and entrepreneurship, engineering sciences, environmental issues, international policy, and the like. And we bring them um, to Stanford for a year-long program where we align them in small groups um, with a faculty advisor and then allow them to take classes across the university. Now, these are not separate classes. These are sitting side by side with undergraduate and graduate students because this is another critical part of what we're exploring. Can we transform the nature of higher education to foster intergenerational learning and teaching rather than having a separation of the age bands? Why not bring them together? And in fact, what we're observing is an incredible amount of interactive mentoring and sharing of ideas among young people and people in mid-life. Um, so this is a key part uh, of the equation, and we couple that with ways of building community, of bringing our fellows together and allowing them to learn from and about each other using the art of storytelling as a mechanism for engaging uh, in their life journey. We bring them together for different interactions with faculty leaders, for colloquia. In fact, on Wednesday of this week, and quite pursuant to the topic of this morning, we'll be spending the whole day on artificial intelligence. And then for various kinds of community activities. And then with our wellness programs, we work with Stanford Medicine to really think about how we can recalibrate that sense of wellness so people have the endurance to traverse the life journey going forward. Now, we view this project or this program as the beginning, as I alluded to earlier, of what we hope will become much more of a national and global transformation. The question we're asking is, shouldn't all or most colleges and universities, large and small, community colleges as well, engage in ways of bringing people back to recalibrate their lives and reignite their sense of purpose. And if we can do that and summate that onto a larger scale, um, can we not only compress individual morbidity, but can we have a larger impact on the societal consequences? The fundamental question that we're asking, which will be longitudinal, of course, is over time, can we see a reduction in the need for medical and social services as people age and do better with their lives? I think that this is a critically important question um, for all of us. As we've heard from Laura and from Andrew, we are witnessing the greatest change that society has yet rendered. It is going to be 20% in the United States of individuals older than 65, but in parts of Europe, and Asia, it's going to be 35 to 40 percent. How are our societies going to calibrate these kinds of interactions? How are we going to avoid a tilt of resource allocations? And I think at least one step toward that is to begin to rethink this trilogy of education, work, and retirement and spread it out through the course of one's life. Rather than compartmentalizing our lives into different sectors, why not think about them as being more of a continuum? Why not utilize the opportunity to gain new knowledge as a way of creating new opportunities? Some of which will be new jobs, new volunteer activities, new contributions to communities, and new ways of being able to protect our society as we move through uh, this next very exciting phase. So thank you very much uh, for listening to me today, and I'll be more than happy to speak with you as well later uh, during the day. Thank you.